All right, good morning. I turned the heat down so that you'd stay awake today. Uh, my name is Becky Larson. Um, I'm an assistant professor and extension specialist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about bunker silage storage, leachate, and runoff management. Um, I did this project. Um, we had six different monitoring sites. Three of them, um, I had a graduate student who collected, and three of them we worked with our Discovery Farms program. Um, and so we monitored six sites to look at um, silage leachate and runoff management. So we've seen a lot of, we see a lot of bunker silage storage these days. Um, I think that's probably an increasing trend all around the U.S. I mean, we're to the point where people are even, aside from the, the bunkers with walls, making very large uh, uh, silage storage piles even to the point where we had one producer bungee jump off the top of his <laughs> silage pile so um, we, we've been having very large large uh, pads being developed um, at a lot of the dairies just to store some of the silage so we've seen increase in interest in in how they're going to store it and minimizing uh, the losses from their feed and then we also have the the we're trying to look at how should we design some of these storage things to collect some of the leachate runoff what are our regulations and where do we want to go so what we see is a lot of people have been increasing their compaction uh, which is beneficial i was talking to some of the guys who work on some of the storage and they're saying you know if you don't reach a certain compaction rate they're seeing penetration of oxygen and air up to three feet into the face um, and, and if they're not feeding at a rate that reduces that face fast enough, they're losing um, a lot of valuable things uh, of feed for the animal. Um, so uh, we started to look uh, at this practice in general uh, because we see a lot of dry weather leachate. Obviously a lot of the producers like to harvest uh, at a moisture that they don't see some of this production, but weather doesn't always allow that. Uh, and at a lot of facilities we see a significant amount of leachate produced. Um, we know from some previous research, right, that the leachate production is, has a lot to do with dry matter content, so we really make some recommendations to try to harvest um, at certain moisture levels for a variety um, of different feeds, but uh, what we've been seeing is that doesn't always happen. Uh, we also know that with the increased compaction, we're seeing even more of that moisture being squeezed out of the feed, uh, more destruction of some of the the actual cellular walls, and so we see uh, more leachate produced. Uh, you know, in runoff in general, we generally see a lot of our producers who are active in managing some of that at a field level. And the silage level, though, we don't see as much buy-in as to why they need to manage that or what they need to do, right? They think of feed as more of a valuable product, and why would we need to, you know, manure, I understand, we don't want that getting into the water, but we have some issues with trying to get them to recognize, um, not all, that, um, that the systems to handle some of this are necessary. Uh, we also have seen um, in some previous work that was done quite a while ago that after um, ensiling, we have the majority of that uh, leachate production occurs in the first, uh, you know, two weeks or so, week to two week uh, after that period. So in Wisconsin, as I'm sure many other places, we have a requirement for permitted facilities to collect all of this dry weather leachate. And all of our data supports that and that it's um, uh, highly corrosive. Um, it has concentrations that can be similar, if not exceeding those average values that we see in manure. Uh, so we're, we've gotten most producers to buy into at least that any dry weather produced has to be collected and needs to be applied to field to agronomic rates and dealt with the way that they uh, handled their manure. Um, we see a lot of deterioration with a lot of these systems. Um, not only is it deteriorating where you would imagine direct runoff, but through the walls, through what people think is, you know, liquid tight concrete systems, we still see a lot of leachate uh, coming through these systems. The pH is pretty low. Um, we see a lot of uh, corrosion due to it. We see a lot of vegetation kill, um, and that can lead on for a very great distance, not just necessarily right next to the feed pad. We also see a lot of systems where when we dig underneath these, we have this um, discoloration and a lot of organic matter, and you can see that the penetration of some of these things through these systems 
um, is pretty significant. Um, we see a lot of need for replacement of uh, the concrete even after a very short duration um, due to the strength and the acidity of a lot of these wastes. So aside from leachate, we have runoff, right, that's produced during our precipitation events. So again, a lot of buy-in on the leachate collection, not as much on the runoff. We're seeing people who have acres and acres of feed storage pad and collecting the runoff for that has been pretty significant. Um, and, and the cost that they associate with that um, ha has been creeping up and the requirements we have for treatment strips and collection um, is, is pushing some of our producers to say, well, you don't have a lot of data on this and you keep expanding how big we have to make some of our storage and other systems. So uh, we wanted to look into some of the, you know, the runoff aspect aside from the, the dry weather leachate. Uh, we also see a significant amount of snowmelt runoff from these areas and the majority of the runoff from these systems, at least in Wisconsin, goes to vegetated treatment areas or vegetated treatment strips. And uh, we know during snow melt time, affected, the performance of those is not very effective. So in our study um, from the six different sites, we had runoff concentrations highly variable, which you'd imagine. Um, you could see the range here. Um, we had dry matter uh, all the way up to around 5%. Um, total nitrogen, we could see numbers creeping up towards the dry weather leachate. Um, and, but again, highly variable. Um, a lot of phosphorus, some sediment bound, but also a lot of that was um, soluble phosphorus. Uh, really low pH. I mean, sometimes we'd get to neutral, but again, that's why we think we see uh, a lot of the burning from a lot of that. So even the runoff we see in many areas has a pretty significant impact. So a lot of the systems we've seen, <laughs> speed. Okay, uh, a lot of the systems we've seen, um, even the runoff, we have a lot of vegetation kill, a lot of sediment buildup, um, and these can go on for quite a distance, and a lot of ways can lead right directly to a waterway. Uh, we also have seen the penetration in some of our silage piles are pretty significant from the rain rainwater infiltration, so if they're not proper manage properly managing the pile, um, we can see that that you are not only causing spoilage and uh, possibly um, losing some of your feed value, but a lot of that is then ending up, a lot of the nutrient content and the losses are ending up in the surface water that's running away from the system. Okay, so we, we make a lot of recommendations for our producers to cover um, maintaining the faces to minimize exposure on, the, on their storage. Uh, covering and wrapping sidewalls is really important. Um, and then really trying to keep an eye out on the forecast as, as we learn that you want to avoid some of the precip precipitation. A lot of this clearly is um, things you would recommend uh, always, but a lot of it doesn't happen, we see, um, on the busyness of many of the systems. So with our, with our systems, when we were collecting the storage, we used six sites. Um, and our objectives were to find out how could we minimize the collection volumes to reduce some of the hauling and storage requirements while also increasing the amount of um, the percent of the load that we collect in and send to storage. Uh, so we were trying to look at how can we design some collection systems as this first phase to reduce the concentrations that we send to our filter strips, increase we what the loading we collect without increasing volume significantly. Okay, so uh, originally, when we looked at our NRCS standard, and that's the one our, and we have, that's the one our even permitted facilities have to follow based on these collection system designs, um, we assumed that there was a first flush, right? So we assume like urban runoff, that you see this initial first flush scenario where, um, where you'd have a, what happened here? Where you'd have a higher concentration um, initially in the runoff. Um, and then, so we had previously aligned our standard to be ready to handle that. I think I'm missing a slide or somehow it got out of sync. Um, so we, we initially thought, apologize, where am I? Here we are. Okay, uh, so we initially thought that we should increase the size of, the, you should, could decrease the size of 
filter strip that you had if you collected more initial part of the rate. So we had a lot of different collection designs out there. So you can see some of them would run, uh, are, most of them are graded uh, to a place where we have some kind of um, sediment removal system uh, and then we collect a certain first flush or the first part might fill up a tank. We had some that had designs where the initial low flows would go into the system and then it would overflow once we got to higher things. All on the idea that this first heavy portion was very hot and that the, the later portions um, could then be sent to a VTA and that, that would be an effective design. Um, you can see that there's multitudes of different designs out there. Um, some of the things we're finding too is any of the systems where you have like a screen, those get taken out very quickly. Uh, Any times it goes to a tank and runs on a pump, those get shut off pretty much the week after you it's installed. Um, so w we see some issues with even the designs that are out there, even though they may function correctly, a lot of the pieces are kind of disabled due to operational issues. Uh, so again, we're seeing very large VTAs um, and some of our designs are still focusing on doing a lot of surface flow on a lot of these things, showing that, oh, a ton of surface flow, you'll get a lot of removal. Where I think most of us know that uh, most of the removal for these systems comes from the soil structure and, um, and some of the treatment that way. So our first point after that long introduction there, it was to look at, does that first um, flush exist? So what we do when we normalize some of the load um, over the volume collected, right? So um, when we look at what percent of the volume was collected and then what percent of the load was collected, we can see um, if we have this kind of upward curve over here that we had a heavy first flush, linear means our loading was pretty similar throughout the storm. And then we had a delayed flush, what we call if we go here. So for almost all of our parameters at all of the six sites, we had very linear loading, right? So we weren't seeing the first flush scenario that we thought we would see. Um, most of them with, were within 5 to 10 percent. You can see it doesn't really matter what the, the, low, the characteristic was, nutrient, uh, nitrogen as compared to phosphorus, we really saw this pretty much linear um, relationship. Uh, so at some of our sites we did really detailed flow versus concentration collection. And the, I mean, you can imagine this seems straightforward, right, initially we would see high concentrations, low flow. Uh, what we were surprised about um, was then, as the storm came, we would see the concentrations drop down, and we didn't imagine they would jump back up quite so high at the end of the storm. We kind of imagined a lot of the litter or other things may have movement even in large storms, and then we would have um, uh, lower concentrations in the end, but that's just not what we're seeing. Uh, the other thing we saw is that many of the parameters were even statistically correlated um, and we would see the same trends even in nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, a lot of the runoff happened to be um, in soluble form, so that would what you would expect. So we did at uh, a number of the sites we were able to do loading, so we kind of had two different sampling schemes and some were intensive where we, those previous one we got collected a lot of sample points from the storm. And some we did um, composite sampling so we could calculate the load over the season. Um, and I noticed here that the numbers are popping up um, for our loading um, so you can kind of understand based on the, so you know we have 2,000 pounds uh, was collected and then 1,300 pounds went to the BTA in this system um, of nitrogen. So the, the size of the system obviously matters, but that number is not popping up, so you can see loading versus on area. So if you want that, I can get that to you. But uh, what we saw is that the loading was pretty significant. Um, a lot of times more than what you'd imagine runoff from a field would look like. Um, and and a, a lot more was loading to our VTAs than um, sometimes we thought in the collection systems than maybe we wanted. Um, and, at, and at these systems, I mean, these are pretty large numbers, and in this first farm, um, over the years, we saw similar trends, uh, kind of similar with rain, and we're still working through some of the data, but these are huge volumes to collect um, at some of these facilities. I'm going to go quickly because I think I'm about out of time. Uh, so again, um, 
pretty similar, different collection system designs. Since they were all similar, they didn't, we didn't see a whole lot of difference. Um, but one of the recommendations, what, what we found after we analyzed a lot of the data, I'm sorry, I had to go through all that loading so quickly, um, but that the first flush really didn't exist, right? So we didn't see that. And so we are changing our standard to represent that the ideal collection system design would collect low flows throughout a storm. Ideally, you would collect the low flows just initially and at the end. Um, but some of the systems may be a little harder to, to design to do that. Um, additionally, what we saw is a lot of these loadings, which I should mention, occurred, um, the big chunks were again in big storm events, but a lot of them occurred right after loading. So if you can adjust your system to do more collection at that time, um, that, that's where we saw a lot of the big chunks of the loading that occurred. Um, what, so what we're looking at now, and we still have some analysis to do, is when we use a low flow where we design for 1% of the peak flow rate from a two-year, 24-hour design storm, we see that we're collecting more of the load that way than collecting the same volume of a first flush or something like that. So now we're trying to look at, it's, it's very data intensive to do these different analyses, but we're trying to look at, will that be our final recommendation? I can't quite tell you that yet, um, but we're looking at how we might force a design sort of to maximize the amount of nutrients collected and minimize what the volume might be. Okay, so um, the other thing we're looking at is since we've had so much correlation with a lot of the uh, the nutrients and some of the other parameters that we measured, we're trying to see if we can get one of the, like a sensor to work to drive our collection to be a little more high tech and collect based on maybe conductivity. Uh, we're, we are looking at conductivity because we think the probes um, are a little uh, more resilient in this kind of corrosive area than maybe some of the other probes that are available and out there for different nutrients. So. Okay, uh, with that, I don't know if I have any time for questions. Yeah, um, go ahead and ask some questions if you have them while I switch presentations. Okay. Any questions? Okay, you got one there. Yeah. On the, um, did you see a deterioration or a um, high nutrient accumulation <coughs> in your BPAs? Uh, so we're still looking at that part. Um, so the first part is to look at our collection system design and then decide what's happening in the VPAs. Um, we're trying to measure, so we're trying to, at least I'm trying to switch the thought process in, into being that we only get, I mean if you look a lot of the VTA literature, right, a lot of the reduction comes actually just from a load reduction off the end of the script. So if you're not infiltrating things, you're really not seeing a lot of reduction besides some sediment trapping, but um, I don't think we get a lot of reduction that way. But so our concerns there are then, depending upon the soil type you have, what kind of treatment you're getting through the soil profile and then what we might be infiltrating. Um, and what we've seen, depending upon your soil type, of course, we're getting different performance. Um, so we're trying to evaluate some additives to our treatment strips to look at if we can reduce some of the concerns we have, particularly with some of the nitrate leaching. Um, so we're still looking at that piece, and I'm not, I'm not ready to talk about any of that. We're still collecting data. Um, but we, we haven't seen any build up too much in some of the treatment strips, but that makes me concerned as where, where might this be going if that's not the case. Uh, phosphorus, yes. We see some of that, but not so much on it. 